We are live. Hello, Australia. Pirate Miles here with the delayed, deferred, and long awaited climate change special. What is Australia doing? What can Australia be doing? And what should Australia be doing about this challenge for our time? I'm here with three people who know the answer to these questions. Three people who have the shared solutions and shared vision, and they're from not one or two, but three Australian political movements that are running for election in 2022. These people have the answers to these questions, and together we think we have a shared vision, a shared solution for a future for all of us. And these three candidates running for election will be asking for your vote. So first I want to introduce Roger Watling, technical business analyst, systems engineer, and hardware specialist, a project manager delivering digital solutions for some of Australia's largest organizations based out of Brisbane. He's gonna be running in Queensland for the Pirate Party of Australia. Thanks, Miles. That um, it's a really good read through of my LinkedIn profile. I'm pretty sure. So, uh, really glad to be here on such a great panel to uh, discuss the feasibility of uh, the Liberals' uh, emissions reduction scheme and look at some real alternative plans for the future. Thank you, Roger. My second guest tonight is Adrian Whitehead, who has campaigned internationally to reverse global warming since 2003. He co-founded the think tank Beyond Zero Emissions in the 90s and has got the first government in the world to declare a climate emergency in 2016. I'm talking about the Darabin Council in Melbourne. Good Adrian. Hi, how are you? I'm fantastic. In fact, I'm feeling really good that we're finally getting together to actually talk about this important issue. And uh, on, on that note, our last guest tonight is Dr. Andrea Leong, a microbiologist who's actually working for the COVID response team in New South Wales Health. You can find uh, Andrea beating the drum or indeed any, literally any other instrument she can get her hands on at various environmental and social events around Sydney when she's not on a live stream talking live about what the science of the future is today. Yep, thanks Miles, uh, great to be here. Yeah, and I mentioned uh, in my bio that bit about the um, playing music of protests um, because I've just found it really important, really invigorating to get to, to protests and play some music. Uh, often the topics are pretty heavy, you know, the destruction of our environment. Um, and I've been really uh, inspired by the way that uh, some young people have taken to digital campaigning during the, um, the COVID lockdowns, but super glad to be back to um, getting back out in the street again for places like this. Fantastic. So let's uh, let's jump right into it then. So tonight, the we're talking climate change. We're talking everything climate change. So to to sort of to sort of give an overview, we're going to be looking at a few different aspects of this. We're going to be looking at what Australia is doing currently, and I'm of course talking about the federal government here. We're going to be talking about what the Australian scientists are talking about climate change, both Australian scientists here in Australia, but obviously international scientists as well, working for organisations like the IPCC and various international research groups. We'll also be talking engineering, infrastructure, architecture. We're going to be talking about the actual practical solutions. But let's uh, let's kind of jump into the present now and look at look at what's actually happening. So, Roger, you work in the tech industry. You work at national scale projects with massive we're talking massive budgets and uh given that the liberal national party used to claim they were efficient economic managers i don't know if they still do and i i'm certainly having a bit of a giggle whenever someone throws that idea around so what are, what are they actually doing about climate change and and, and is it actually uh, some kind of a sensible financial position here yeah thanks miles um look it's it's a really good question um, I think the and the fact that we can read through the the Liberals emissions uh, reduction plan and still come out with that same question is a good point. Uh, there's a lot of information in there. It's uh, it seems like a very good, like well put together consulting deck. Um, I'm sure the engineers out there are hating it um, because there's there's not nearly enough detail. Um, the plan doesn't really have uh, definitive timelines or or justification to some of the numbers that they've uh, that they've come up with as um, as part of the plan. Right. Well, we, we've got some engineers here in in the room with us, and we've got some scientists here in the room too, and we've got some uh, advocates and, and and activists in the room as well. So, what's uh, <clears throat> what what's the um, obviously they they've got to have something in there. The government's got to actually 
do something and and i know a few of us here are kind of rolling our ideas the idea that that uh, this government or indeed any government is in australia is capable of actually pulling off meaningful policy goals but surely surely with an election around the corner that scott morrison and the liberal party or the national party is actually suggesting that uh with collapsing agricultural output across the east coast with uh, declining revenues from uh, tourism in north queensland with great barrier reef dying off mm -hmm. surely with this immediate economic impact that we're already seeing massive droughts across the uh, hunter darling the murray darling basin and the hunter region uh, surely with this immediate bottom line already dropping out of the economy due to climate change they're actually talking about doing something is there is there is there something in there that like maybe maybe we can boil it down to some dot points um if there was anything specific in there i definitely didn't notice it um and i admit i did start to to drop off a few points it was a little bit dry um but as you'd expect for for some for this kind of plan um most of the content in there is well written in terms of being as you say is something that would you would expect coming out of a government going into an upcoming election. Um, there's probably just enough um, commitment in there to pull the wall over existing liberal voters who are you know, somewhat concerned with environmental issues. Obviously, the party uh, isn't really known for that, um, while also uh, not promising enough to maintain you know, their um, affiliation with the nationals who, who love the coal um, and also to, to not put themselves on the hook um, for actually making any, any substantial change. Um, a lot of the content in, in the plan um, is great content and it looks at what Australia has done to date um, and some of the technologies that, um, that businesses are coming up with. Um, and it is, it's fantastic uh, progress. The fact that the government is pointing at that and using that as basically the premise of, you know, we'll be fine because we're making these progress and these progressions and we'll continue to make that in between now and 2050. Uh, so she'll be right, mate. You know, that's, that's the concerning point for me. There's not nearly enough commitment at a government level. So let's uh, let's let's sort of open this up a bit more broadly now to the rest of the floor. And, and before I kind of jump into that, we've got a good question in chat, and I just want to put it out there right now. If you're listening live and you're you're tuning in from around Australia or indeed around the world, I can see uh, uh, German pirate Max Keem tuning in from Europe. Thank you so much. I don't know what ungodly hour it is there, but mm -hmm. I can see that. Um, it's really great to have the support from the European pirate movement here tuning in. We've got a comment in chat from pirate from local Australian pirate now going back to uh, Sydney here on the East Coast from local pirate John August, who's actually uh, um, actually a good friend of Andrea's and put the comment in saying uh, she's he's seen Andrea around at protests and uh, made a good point there that it's made a, a real impact having live music as compared to just pre-recorded stuff at, at all these big events. So, Andrea, what's uh, What's, what are Sydney siders saying about the federal government right now? What are activists saying? And um, what does New South Wales more generally think about the federal government with regards to climate change? Yeah, um, I think your call just now, Miles, for the government to do something or the question, are they doing anything, is something that we could level at the Liberal government of the last eight years. We had, um, you know, the ending of the ETS, then we had the, the NEG, the... Um, National Energy Guarantee, the Renewable Energy Target, the RET, Clean Energy Target, however you pronounce that acronym, and none of these things have really stuck and they've been uh, the cause of culture wars because somehow energy has become a political left-right, um, as much as I dislike those terms, it's become the political football of Australian politics and that's that's to our great shame. It's, um, it's just mind-boggling that uh, something as simple as conserving the planet we live on has become a political football. And I'd also like to probably echo what uh, Roger said about um, it's, it's sort of the current plan is trying to play both sides of the coin, looking like it's doing something by announcing targets, uh, having some pretty presentations, mm -hmm. uh, but also not actually doing anything ambitious, not not really announcing anything that is going to make really big dents in our greenhouse gas emissions. Just um, um, pointing out what we've already done. And these are existing technologies. You know, they say this is going to be a technology-led um, reduction in our greenhouse gases. Um, but we have these technologies. All we need to do now is deploy them. 
been a very disappointing um, eight years. And speaking of technologies, we've got a question in chat from a uh, local Brisbane campaigner, Tyron Delisle, actually about uh, nuclear power and energy. And I love that question. I really want to get into that question, but let's just put that one on um, on hold for the moment because we're actually going to get jump into energy policy and uh, generation technologies a little bit later. But first, I want to uh, keep moving, m moving down the uh, east coast. Let's get right into the southern tip around Victoria. So, Adrian, you're a Melbourne local. You've campaigned across Victoria for longer than most people have been talking about climate change. What's happening in Victoria as one of the biggest agricultural centres of, of Australia? Yeah, so we've got, you know, on sort of paper, the local Labor government looks a lot better than the federal government. Um, and, you know, they are, which let's just face facts, that the, the Labor reaction to climate change uh, is a lot stronger. But at the same time, we end up with this ridiculous situation where we have... Uh, the Dan Andrews government getting out there and expanding and actively promoting gas extraction uh, along the Otway Basin out 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 to where we've never been mining gas before. Gas is a dead end industry, just like the coal industry. Yet we're sitting there pouring, you know, millions of dollars into that and pulling gas out for such a short term horizon. And we're still logging our old growth forest and our native forests in Victoria. So. The state government is so committed to that, they actually, the industry was shutting itself down because of the economic, uh, the economic reality wasn't working for them anymore. So our state government bought the largest mill in the central highlands in this maintaining it with state funding so it could keep going. So what the, the just outcome would be, would be to actually go out there and uh, pay out the workers and the workforce, look at providing them with new training, new job opportunities. We all know this story. There's there's millions of jobs that can be created if we actually take that climate change response. <laughs> so, you know, we've got we've got a bit going both ways. But the bottom line is no one, you know, federal, federal state, Labor Liberal is tackling climate change seriously enough to start talking about going beyond that net zero twenty fifty. Because let's face it, another thirty excuse me, another 30 more years of increasing greenhouse gas emissions, like adding more and more greenhouse to the atmosphere before we even think about reducing the amount of greenhouse gases we've already got in the atmosphere, means the fires, floods, storms, etc., crop damage, crop failures that we're seeing right now will in keep getting increasing in more and more severity. And ultimately, we'll mm. fill that through the fires, we'll fill that through, you know, uh, impacts around food supply, food pricing, all that sort of stuff. And the thought that we can keep doing this for some time beyond 2050 before we even turn around global warming and start a cooling and get back to where we are today is just unbelievable. And um, it's great that you bring up gas there because that's actually a, a really hot topic up here in Queensland. I'll bring it back up north again for, um, uh, for, for, for Roger here, because out, out in the West, we've got uh, massive gas fields around uh, Warwick and Toowoomba through the center of Queensland. And, and these have been expanding and these have been growing. And we'll probably, um, we'll probably get more into this later, but the Queensland Labor government has actually put forward and, and people will, in Australia, people will often point to the Queensland Labor government and the Victorian Labor government as two of sort of the front runners of either what they're doing right or what they're doing wrong, depending on, on hmm. who's, whether you're blue team or red team, you know, who's, who's, who's party you're with. But uh, in Queensland, the Labor government, they're expanding gas generation. They're, they're, they're deploying hydrogen outreach with uh, Twiggy Forrester, the, the well-known environmentalist. <laughs> and so we, we've got a lot of environmental environmental activists up here who who are kind of throwing up their hands in the air and going, well, well what's happening with that? What's Why why are we pivoting to, to yet more gas when we're called the Sunshine State? So yep. um, just like, what's the deal? Yeah, well, like uh, like Adrian mentioned, neither neither side of the the fence is really doing their part in making any any firm commitments um, to do anything about climate change. Um, it's one thing to look at the current federal plan and and what the the Liberal Party is doing, and they're they're known for being climate change denialists anyway. Um, on the Labor side, you'd, you'd kind of hope that there was something something better in their plans. Um, but as you say, you know, the, the continued exploration for coal seam gas, um, there's still, you know, a lot going on around the Adani mines um, and digging into and extracting water from the basins um, up here. You know, there's, there's so much happening on both sides of the fence, mm. given that 
for those who, who don't know, Queensland uh, state level is under a Labor government. So, you know, you've got both sides showing that um, any any real direction around climate change is not high on their priority list. Hmm. And that's a, that's a really, really good point about water too. And I know <laughs> we're in Australia, we're one of the one of the driest countries on earth. You wouldn't know it in some of the Queensland rainforests mm -hmm. up here, which I'm going to be, with a bit of luck, I'm going to be in the depths of next week, to, trying to um, disappear and retrace tra tra one of the uh, Stinson Rec rescue trails through Lamington National Park. But that, um, but just jumping back on topic here, water is what's happening with water. Uh, mining consumes huge amounts. Gas, uh, hydraulic fracking consumes huge amounts. A lot of our agricultural industries, our livestock consumes huge amounts of water. And obviously we need energy for a developed society. We need food for uh, any kind of society. We need food to live. But is this water consumption proportional? And is, are there ways we can actually grow these essential, produce these essential foods, produce this vital energy without consuming huge amounts of water in, uh, in, in highly water destitute areas? Now, I want to, um, there's a really good question in chat that renewables require backup from something and, and, and this commenter, Matt McKenzie, is saying, well, why don't we use gas as that backup? So I want to come back to that one, though, because we're going to get into energy generation and, um, and a generation mix a little bit later in the stream. But let's, uh, let's sort of look at, um, look at another related topic to do with this water consumption. The, the East Coast of Australia is, is the agricultural breadbasket of, uh, uh, of Australia and particularly like that big focus on Victoria. So what's, what's happening with with agriculture in in the carbon emission space. Andrew, do you want to chime in here? Oh, so I was actually expecting to have a bit of a, a spiel about gas, actually. Um, I wanted to, Sorry to put you on the... Yeah, uh, no, that's right. I wanted to um, uh, bring it back to New South Wales um, and their, um, mm. their gas exploration as well. Um, yeah, so I don't, if you want to keep it on topic, um, I don't know if you... Oh no, no, please! If you want to, um, like, go ahead with the gas. Yeah, absolutely. Let's let's round off that topic before we move on. Yeah, yeah. One of the coolest uh, places that uh, playing music with the, the Riff Raff Radical marching band has taken me is up to Gloucester, <coughs> up the um, mm. for a Lock the Gate protest. And the band was only there for two days, but um, that was some fantastic work by the locals up there and uh, in the region. Um, you know, they they locked the gate to to the point that. Um, uh, they uh, kicked out the, the coal seam gas exploration. It had no social licence up there. So, I mean, that's an example of, um, I suppose, the New South Wales state government, which is a Liberal government, um, also being pro-gas, but at the same time they're pro-renewables because there's money in renewables. They know that. Um, hmm. But um, you can't just build more renewables. You've got to stop digging fossil fuels out of the ground as well. And then hmm. another, just another little comment on gas. We are quite... I was working for the uh, public housing department here in Victoria back in the mid 2000s and as their sustainability advisor and um, we were just expanding the amount of gas that was going to all of the public housing and I said no 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 please don't do that and they go why and I said well we're about to open up a, an export terminal on the east coast and the moment they do that gas is we won't have cheap gas anymore they'll be exporting it and they'll drag our domestic prices up and that's what happened. I think it was about a 300% increase in domestic prices. So effectively, for the profits of international corporations and a, and a tiny handful of jobs around the exporting of the gas on the East Coast, every Australian that was using gas is effectively paying a tax or subsidising that profit, however you want to think about that. Mm. But on the, the good side, they did something to the gas industry that as environmentalists or, or people concerned with you know, climate change, um, we could have never done. Like you'd imagine suddenly say, oh, because of climate change, we're going to increase the price of gas to every Australian household by 300% in a few years. There would have been riots. People would have been tearing parliaments down. You know, it would have been like on the street, on the steps of parliament right now in, in Victoria, if you've heard about that on the news. But, but if you do it for international corporations that are looking to make profits for their shareholders, that's apparently a good thing. So, you know, it's helped undermine the gas industry in Australia. And a lot of people are getting off gas. You know, I got off gas, it was a really great day, swapped it out for an induction cooker, got rid of the gas heater, and Victoria gets a bit cold. Um, and it was all triggered by a hot water system breaking down. So we replaced it with electric and now we've got solar panels and we're not paying that, that annual cost 
just to be connected for gas as well as the gas itself. So, yeah. That's incredibly infuriating. And, and I actually remember hearing about that as well. Yeah, that um, we're setting up gas export terminals and selling, selling Australian products overseas, exporting it where instead of, instead of leaving it here in Australia, at the very least, leaving it here in Australia where Australians could make use of our own resources. So, um, so we'll, we'll, let's get into the science of that in a minute, but let's, um, let's just sort of finish off on agriculture first. What's the federal government doing about agriculture? And, and, and kind of drawing it back to the LNP's emissions reductions plan, if they're not doing anything, then, then it must be up to individuals and communities to come in here and, and pick up the slack, because I don't see any other, any other alternative, really. Um, yeah, um, if you don't mind me jumping in here, um, there's, okay. yeah, there are some, um, uh, lots of farmers, especially in Victoria, I think, but um, around Australia who are trying to put carbon into their soils to improve their productivity. Um, and it's, it's talked about as a, a possible income stream for the future, but as far as I'm aware, I'm pretty certain there is just one lone farmer um, in Victoria who is actually gaining carbon credits for putting carbon back into the soil yeah so there's amazing yeah i mean there's 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 few issues around agriculture and climate change is one I, I worked on the beyond zero emissions land use plan and in that plan we basically looked at basically reconverting about 30 percent of the agricultural land back into uh, a, a natural vegetation at least tree forested and it makes a lot of sense there's stream sides of high erosion areas um, that can put a lot of carbon back into the the ground a lot of farmers now are looking at what's called regenerative agriculture which is the long rest short rotation rotation grazing systems that allow the grass to grow and the roots to go deep and plants feed carbon down into the soils to promote fungi and bacteria to go and collect the nutrients for the plants basically do a, a cation exchange thing going on and sugar exchange for them so those farmers are, are getting a lot more carbon in the soil and that's great because we've our, our soils were once black and rich with carbon so there's there's historical notes from the early explorers in their diaries and things that talk about you know the, the deep soft soils of victoria if you if you go out on farmland in victoria now and uh, you know other than maybe a really muddy part but it's it's denuded you know soil profiles of sort of 10 centimeters of of, of living dark or slightly gray you know um, um soil you know live soil and then the rest is sort of subsoil whereas it used to be much mm. deeper and you can bring that back and farmers are doing it but they need to be paid to do it and what we shouldn't be doing is we shouldn't be thinking about offsetting something else so that we shouldn't be taking a flight overseas or burning some coal and offsetting with that that was that was carbon that was lost from our soils because of farming because of land clearing and needs to get put back there anyway and our farmers should be paid to do that and manage the the land in a way that builds that carbon back and one one thing that i'm really into is this concept of biochar which is taking uh waste organic matter turning it effectively into charcoal in a way that the, you then use it in agriculture and the thing about that is that it's incredibly stable. It can last for hundreds or thousands of years. And you might have heard on news today, what we're wanting to do with all our, all our organic waste now is to burn it. So when you burn it, you make power and you make ash and you get very, very little carbon sequestration. And the hard thing to do with climate change is to get that carbon that we put up in the atmosphere over, you know, since the industrial revolution to get that back down. That is the really hard thing. In Australia, we can make power and, um, I think we're going into a bit later, but you know, the Beyond Zero Emissions Plan worked out how to do that in the 2000s, you know, for all of Australia to go 100% renewable. So that's easy. What's hard is that drawdown and farmers have a key role in doing that and they should be paid to do it. I agree. I totally agree. And um, we've got some great questions in chat here again about uh, from from Tyler and Delisle about the uh, transmission grid, and we're going to be getting into that later, 100%. And uh, another comment about how gas exports represent false and betrayed promises. And I want to kind of bring that up and highlight that on stream that uh, we can and should be using Australian products within Australia and producing Australian products within Australia to solve Australian products, uh, Australian problems around energy. 
So another comment in chat that carbon farming is difficult. Well, let's um, let's let's hear more from farmers about what's going on. And let's also, I really want to stress that we should be supporting farmers, just like you were saying, Adrian, supporting farmers to make these transitions, like uh, like the Queensland government has attempted to do with uh, clean clean water and the Great Barrier Reef catchment. Unfortunately, they've been tied up in and um, in in legal battles around how that program went, which is a real shame that. Um, that lobby groups and the Queensland LNP would try and fight farmers to uh, subsidies and support for farmers to um, to actually uh, 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 modernise their um, their usage of fertilisers and the um, the water emissions on their own properties. But uh, let's let's kind of um, go back to a point you made earlier about how early on in. Um, uh, or, or really going back to pre-colonisation Australia, the soils of Victoria were deep and black, rich, soft soils. There's um, That actually makes me think of an amazing book I read a couple of years ago, which uh, a few of you might be familiar with, called uh, Dark Emu by Bruce Pascoe, about how the Aboriginal Australian economy and agriculture was in fact extremely developed and extremely advanced. And they would, um, and as, as he talks about in this novel, how there's, there's plenty of evidence from early settlers and uh, and from uh, their their own accounts, the, these early explorers and colonizers, about how there was enormous fields of native grains and yams being tilled, farmed, and harvested in uh, in in a, in a sort of almost crop rotation similar to how Europeans farmed. Mm. And um, we're talking hundreds of hectares with huge teams of of, of dozens of, of of workers of laborers. Uh, uh, First Nations peoples, have you um have you got any have, have you read that novel or listened to that audio book? Um, I've met Bruce uh, a couple of times, um, and oh, amazing. and uh, and I've heard him talk about it a lot, and um yeah, and it's it is amazing how we've treated our land. One of the problems with getting carbon in our land is the way we farm and the way we use harmful animals. You know, in Victoria, once you go into the north where it's hotter and drier. It can take years and years just using normal carbon building systems to even measure an increase in a farm beyond background variability, just to get beyond the statistical sort of randomness. So it is really difficult, mm. and and you know we need to really look at uh, agriculture in a in a new way to make sure that it is sustainable in the long term. And part of the problem with climate change is throwing everything up in the air. So, for example, a, a organic blueberry farmer who uh, is where I've, uh, you know, my family's got a bush block. Uh, he's now putting in uh, blueberries that grow from northern New South Wales. That's where he's sourcing his blueberries from because already we're seeing that level of change in the temperatures that, you know, you're warranting moving things halfway across Australia. And, and that matches the butterfly distribution as well. So apparently a lot of the Brisbane butterflies are now down in Melbourne and the Cairns butterflies are in Brisbane. So if we keep, and we're not even at 1.5 degrees. So, you know, agriculture, once we hit two degrees, will become incredibly difficult and we just can't go there and be on those sort of temperatures. So there's yeah, a lot of really serious issues that we have to face around it. So let's, um, jumping back to uh, some, something you sort of touched on earlier, obviously a lot of the uh, early colonists were, were clearing land to use for agriculture, for, uh, for livestock, for cattle, for introduced European crop species and animals. And a lot of this land clearing is actually going on today. And uh, I, I obviously can't speak for New South Wales, but I know in Queensland, we've had huge amounts of land clearing, uh, particularly a lot, in, a lot of, in central and central Queensland, but also particularly around southeast Queensland, around the greater Brisbane area for, um, so in central Queensland, it's clearing for agriculture in, in southeast Queensland, it's clearing for, uh, for, for housing development. Roger, what's your take on this? Yeah, I'm not a fan. Um, I'll just put it bluntly like that. I definitely don't have um, the, the professional insights that, uh, that the others might be able to, to contribute, but it's noticeable. Um, is substantially noticeable just as uh, as a resident around the area. I remember not long ago um, going for going for a hike up the Glasshouse Mountains, and that's an area that for years has been like it's an amazing area. Southeast Queensland is not exactly rainforest, but it's you know it's um, you know it's always lush and green and a great place to to go for a go for a bushwalk and um, just to see like right at the base of the mountains, just half of it cleared is really devastating. 
And, um, you know, I can't help thinking back to my science studies in, um, in primary school that talked about, you know, the water cycles and how much that the, the forests and the mountain ranges have played such a, a, a huge part in, um, in those kinds of activities and how that uh, our actions um, in those areas are, are, are devastating. So even if it's not contributing to, um, to uh, emissions directly, there are other, other aspects of it, reducing the amount of um, natural carbon um, you know, capture with those forests, um, interruption to the environments, um, and, a, and a whole range of, of different effects. Yeah. So we got a comment in chat from uh, Tyrone that uh, is a proposal. To, how about we end urban sprawl by increasing density within the existing urban footprint? Mm -hmm. So there's a claim here that Brisbane is far too sprawled, and I'm not going to, uh, <laughs> I'm not even going to have a crack at Sydney here. But, but what, what's your take on urban density, Roger? Yeah, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't deny that um, Brisbane is definitely, you know, sprawled. And I think it's it's the same for most. Uh, most capital cities um, in Australia, right? I think we've we've all grown up with mm. this idea of everyone uh, wants a house with uh, with a with a block of land, uh, which is nice when you've got kids growing up in a backyard and things like that. Um, as as we grow, then yeah, it makes sense to to increase density closer to those areas, right? Not to to sprawl so much. Um, the the need for such large areas. Um, for for living and considering how small our um, our households are um, in respect to the size of land we take up as well, um, you know, generally uh, a family will will have maybe two or three kids, but once they're gone, families will will stay on those those properties for for a, a long time. They become you know part of part of that, which you can't take away from from people wanting that. Um, but we need to to keep up with the times and and understand that that impact um, in the the density. So moving down south now, Andrew, what's happening with land clearing in New South Wales? Yeah, it's much the same in New South Wales. We've had um, Francis Pike from the Australian Forests and Climate Alliance come and speak at a science party event a while ago, and um, there's yeah, there's so much land clearing that you don't know about. It's, it's hidden from view. Um, and some of that is to, a lot of that is to, um, uh, for the wood chipping industry, we sell wood chips to Northern Europe, which they burn as a renewable energy source. Hmm. Um, it's, um, it's, it's only renewable in the sense that you can grow trees again, but it's very inefficient. It's, um, it's, uh, it's a terrible contributor to greenhouse gases it's not something we should be doing with trees and it includes um old growth forests not all plantation forests either um yeah so that's um you know that's that's a lot of habitat that we're not getting back we talk about um climate change um but the the ecological and habitat destruction side of it goes hand in hand with that we, once we lose those species they're gone forever that's um that's habitat for uh, you know much loved koala populations in Australia, um, and yeah, once those pockets are gone, they're never coming back. Um, I know there's been uh, huge campaigns up here in Queensland as well around trying to 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 save the koala. Roger, what's happening there? Um, yeah, definitely. I mean, the koala species, I'm pretty sure, is is becoming endangered across Australia. Um, you know, the the planning is not sufficient around these residential areas, right? Um, I know there there are requirements to to leave passageways in between these heavily dense uh, residential areas. Koalas don't necessarily know that they're meant to stick to those paths, right? Like they're generally a couple of meters wide of, of tall trees and they're meant to, to make their, their usual um, progressions around the neighborhood within those those areas. So unfortunately you see a lot of, um, you know, injured uh, wildlife on the sides of the roads due to this urban sprawl and there's just not enough taken into, into account for, um, 
for where these habitats are, are being removed for for our you know beloved animals. These are our our native animals. It's really sad to see. So in, in Victoria, we've still got uh, a lot of clearing for forestry going on, and uh, I mentioned that earlier. But you know, one of the interesting things around climate, even if it's a we uh, uh, most carbon dense forests are uh, a wet uh, wet temperate um, forest and rainforest up in the sort of mountains, but even the drier forest, sort of the sort of three hundred ton a hectare type thing, if you put a simple ten dollars a ton carbon price on the carbon loss from that logging event. It, it makes the economics of the logging completely unviable. So it's a, you know, a, a, as much as carbon prices have their limitations to some degrees, it's a, a simple thing applied to forestry, which obviously they don't want to do. They have a tendency of, you know, trying to protect certain industries. Um, we would finish that. And the thing is, when once you log a forest, it doesn't matter whether it's uh, clear fell, which is an intense industrial logging, or even you know mildly better selective logging, it changes the ecology. I've done the transects, mm -hmm. I've seen the the changes, and it, it's essentially a, a conversion of a native ecosystem to a even aged um, pseudo plantation with some minor um, biodiversity benefits. And you know whether it's the habitat trees that um, they leave, they all fall over within a you know a few years, etc. They, they log right up to rainforest cores in Victoria. Um, rainforests need a, a buffer to stop the fires bursting into the cores. So there's just problem after problem. And it's essentially, it's the just the classic story of powerful industries, powerful businesses, lobby groups, um, and in some cases, particular unions having influence over the Labor Party in some areas and on some key seats. So you just see that sort of corruption of our political system um, through the forestry story here in Australia as well. And this comes to a, a, a good point around planning too. And it seems pretty obvious that uh, our governments are not planning for anything outside of their uh, elected time slot. Um, right, so you mentioned uh, Adrian introducing a, a price on, on carbon, which seems like a pretty logical thing to do. And it's always shirked at because you know, it would damage industries, it would raise prices on different things. But there's never even any thought on, well, let's introduce it over time to allow these industries to, to migrate off or to get people trained in other areas. It's, it's seen as either black or white. Um, you either do it or you don't. And there's no no transition plans, um, which I think would be the the logical way to go to to provide an incentive to move away from from these these activities. And and it looks like if we don't do it, uh, the Europeans or someone else will put a price on our exports and our, our carbon for you know for us. And we're we're backing ourselves into a really nasty corner because we're not acting to reduce our carbon density. Yeah, you know, other than by all the good people, you know, doing it themselves, putting their own solar on their mm -hmm. roofs and, you know, buying green power, or whatever. But, you know, in terms of the government led stuff, that's pretty bad at a federal level, at least. So we're going to back our industries into a really nasty corner. And when the crunch comes and there's global climate action, um, they're going to get hammered. They won't be able to get their products overseas because they'll just have this nasty carbon price put on them by third parties. That is. Go on. Go on, I go on, Andrew. Yeah, I'm just going to say if we could just jump back while we're on ecology and soil carbon a moment ago, um, if there's any um, technologies of the future that our government should be in uh, investing in, one of them could be measurement of soil carbon, which I understand is a barrier to farmers being able to um, measure the carbon in their soil. It's slow and expensive. Um, and it's just something that's genuinely uh, not uh, not a, a solved problem yet, as opposed to many of the things that were um, mentioned in that, that cynical document, mm -hmm. uh, things like, oh, solar panels. Oh, yeah, I haven't seen much of that before. Australia's got the highest uptake of rooftop solar in the world um, and some of the best solar research, solar panel research in the world. Uh, that's fine. Um, there are genuine new technologies that uh, have not been mentioned at all, um, like the, the soil carbon measurements uh, and other things that are also really solved problems like electric vehicles. Uh, very little around that as well. Um, 
Yeah, we're, and we're in Victoria, we're the uh, world's first electric vehicle tax. Yay. <laughs> wow. Very progressive Labor government, guys. It, Very progressive. It's pretty crazy, apparently. And the thing is, they, they put it out there saying, oh, electric vehicles aren't paying their fuel tax, but the fuel tax is an actual federal tax. So for money that they weren't getting directly, they put a new tax in because they apparently weren't getting this money, which they never got anyway. And you could almost accept it if the government rolled out a comprehensive, excellent uh, charging infrastructure and actually paid for that. I could accept it because then I could actually drive my electric vehicle somewhere. But at the moment, it's I've got a very cheap electric vehicle and it doesn't go very far. And um, consequently, it doesn't get driven very much i would love to pay the tax i would love to be able to go around the country in my electric vehicle but um there just isn't the, the charging stations and you know if you if you're an owner of a tesla yeah by all means because they've put their own charging stations in and and people put those in but um new zealand's a great example wa's got a really nice uh, electric car highway going um yeah, my brother lives in japan i visited him once and the very best car park in the airport is, of course, an electric vehicle charging sp spot, you know, and that's you walk out the door from the passenger, you know, where all the shops are and bang, there's just spots for electric cars. So, um, yeah, very disappointing. And um, of course, we still have our weekends and we'll still mm -hmm. be, you know, ScoMo won't be able to, we, we won't be killing the weekends with electric cars, but um, Norway's proven that they still have weekends and they've got a massive electric car uptake. So, yeah. Well, all I'm hearing here is uh, Scott Morrison taunting Bill Shorten a few years ago that um, apparently Bill Shorten wants us to all say, see you later to the SUV. Meanwhile, we've got Victorian Labor here literally putting in a tax on electric vehicles and, and slowing down the rollout. Like, what, what, what's the deal here? They're just going back and forth with no meaningful policy or no meaningful solutions. So the, and, and, the and, LNP's emission reductions are all show. And the funniest thing about the Victorian um, thing, apparently quite a lot of the people who get rich enough to buy a Tesla, guess what? They've also got a bit of property in some other state. So all the <laughs> Teslas are now getting registered in New South Wales or Tasmania or Queensland or South Australia. And Victoria's missing out on everything, including the, the registration and insurance that gets paid normally when you register your car. So well done, Victoria. So... So, so yeah, uh, great sort of policy turnaround there. And but but the federal Liberal Party is is doing nothing, and the uh, Labor Party is uh, no idea what it's doing. It's all over the place. So what's what is the solution? And what are we proposing? And and what do we actually want to do? Andrew, do you want to take this one? Oh sure, yeah. Just that's just that little little question of what do we want to do. It's just investment, really, isn't it? We have the technology. We have to accept that this is going to be an expensive problem to solve, but we have to measure it against the cost of doing nothing. Climate change and the damage it's causing is costing trillions of dollars a year right now um, in terms of damage and lost productivity and early deaths. So uh, we've, we've managed, we've gotten ourselves into the climate emergency that we have by burning cheap fossil fuels and it's, um, it's lifted our standard of living enormously, but we can't keep doing that because now the costs are becoming too great. And we have the technology, it's, um, it, it just needs investment to, um, to get it over the line and to, um, to decarbonise our economy. And we can start by uh, moving a lot of things we power by burning things, um, uh, burning carbon that's been in the ground, um, to, no, <laughs> sorry. Um, uh, the first step that we can take is to move things uh, from directly burning, you know, combustion to, uh, to electrical um, versions of the same thing. So electrifying our vehicles, electrifying our cooking, electrifying our heating in homes, just basically electrifying everything. And that'll actually reduce our energy needs uh, because it's just more efficient to, um, produce electricity even when you're burning fossil fuels right it's more efficient to burn fossil fuels um, at a power plant and take that electricity to your home or to charge a car than it is to burn fossil fuels in your home to warm it or to cook with or to power your uh, internal combustion engine car 
and then but, but andrea when we're when we're buying electric vehicles yeah. doesn't that mean that the coal plants are putting out more carbon pollution because of the increased energy usage yeah. i don't understand yeah and then step two is to decarbonize everything decarbonize electricity so um it's yeah using electricity to power things is just more efficient than burning things directly so the overall energy use is less and then step two is to decarbonize electricity and that can be done if we can decarbonize um you know in this country 12 15 percent of our grid what's stopping us from decarbonizing the rest it's just building the infrastructure yeah and there literally is nothing stopping us from decarbonizing the rest so beyond zero emissions which is the think tank that i founded um, went on to develop the stationary energy plan in the late 2000s and it showed that we could go to 100% renewable energy for about, um, uh, you know, at the time, a 30% increase in electricity prices. It does sound a lot, but you, you can roll out efficiencies around home insulation, all that sort of stuff at the same time to reduce the heating and cooling costs of people's homes, etc. So you can, you can pretty much make it net neutral. Um, and if you did that, and you could do it in 10 years, and that was using sort of 2006 off the shelf technology. Since then, we've gone a really long way in terms of rolling out renewables and the renewables have just got better and better and better. Things like the, the battery stabilization of grid. Someone had, was a question that we had earlier, what, why, um, what about grid issues? And yes, of course, we're gonna to have to rebuild the grid. That's a part of it. And when we first, um, when me, I was working with Matthew Wright when I first set up Beyond Zero Emissions, Matt's a bit of a genius. He has the, could hold the whole grid in his head, basically. And he'd be talking to, you know, electricity traders and stuff. And he'd say, we can do 100% renewables. And they'd go, no, we can't. And he'd say, $2 billion grid upgrade. And they'd sit back there for about 60 seconds and they'd go, oh, yeah, of course. And because our grid is designed to take energy out from energy producing hubs based around coal and put it out like a spider web to our cities and our country areas where we need a grid that's dynamic and can flow energy in all sorts of directions all over the place. And what the, the one little thing that used to be the tipping point and people talk about, it's one of the myths, it's about the grid stabilization. How it used to get stabilized was these huge generators are basically flywheels going round and round and round and round and round. And there's all sorts of mechanisms to maintain grid stability by um, having different, you know, you predict predictions and different um, uh, bits of generators coming on and off at certain times. But in the end, the real micro, the micro stabilization came from these flywheels effectively of all these massive generators, speeding up, slowing down as the demand and uh, um, flex slightly. Now that can be done by batteries with computers now. The other thing it can be can done by is solar concentrating thermal plants that you'd put on the sunny inside of the Great Dividing Range all the way up from South Australia to Queensland and over in WA as well. They take solar power, store it as heat, and then can turn that heat exactly like burning coal. You turn the heat into high pressure steam, Bob's your uncle, you spin in the generator, you've got the same stabilization. All right. So it's it's whether you're using those systems in combination with those grid stabilizing batteries, we can do it with a grid upgrade. And it's simple as that. And it's much cheaper now to do it than it was back in 2006, 7, 8, when we were working on the original plan. And we've got to do it. That's the point. We just have to do this thing and holding on to our old technologies, going out there and, you know, mining gas and stuff. Um, it's, it's about looking after a certain sector of the economy and putting the rest of us uh, in serious trouble because we're going down to a really nasty climate change future if we keep going the direction we are. And we can't just use the excuse of uh, increasing technology with lower costs. You know, it might be cheaper to do it now than it was in 2006. Um, that's not an excuse to put it off for another 10 years because it'll be cheaper to do it then. At some point, we'll run out of runway, right? Like this is... We, we need to we need to get a run up so we can jump across this before it's too late you know like heat is a great um, analogy for this right because if you take something that you're cooking off the stove it continues cooking for a while right like it doesn't stop straight away if we leave it till 2050 and have everything right on zero and go yay we made it it's still going to keep on going up for a while before it goes goes down so we need to need to be ahead of this we can't put it off 
uh, it needs to be a now thing. Mm, and like Adrian mentioned, it's not just a matter of getting to net zero emissions. We have to get to negative zero emissions to restore that safe climate because we're heading for that two degrees warmer world. We can't stay there. Yeah, we can't even stay where we're at the moment. Like if we're if we're where we're at at the moment, we froze it at one point one or one point two. Um, we lose Bangladesh, we lose low lying cities, we lose the Great Barrier Reef, we lose so much and a lot of our ecology, and we'll have a repeat of the 2019 20 fires or the 2009 fires or 2003 or six fires, etc. etc. It, it, it just we have to go backwards. It's a global cooling that is our goal, and you only get that through negative emissions. And we need to get there as fast as possible. This net zero stuff is just literal suicide on a pretty big scale so you're all running for election and if you and hopefully when we all get into government what are we actually planning to build what are we planning to spend money on what are we going to do on day one through to day 100 through to day dot 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 andrea leong what do you want to build step one declare a climate emergency Step two, start building the storage and transmission infrastructure. Uh, there are private investors, companies, um, engineering firms wanting to build the energy, the renewable energy infrastructure, generation infrastructure, the, um, the wind turbines and the solar farms. And they just cannot uh, get onto the grid. Um, New South Wales has renewable energy zones, so that's a start. Uh, places where it's windy and sunny, and uh, there's commitments there to connect those areas up to the grid. And you know that'll get us a bit of the way there, but um, not to not to 100% at this rate, at the rate that we need to. So we've got a few questions in chat about uh, a few questions and comments about batteries, about the frequency of transmission, about the. Uh the efficiency of uh, different energy options to responding for change in demand. Roger, what's happening with the Queensland energy grid and, and what does the Pirate Party propose there? Uh, that's a really good question, Miles. Um, yeah, so so the Queensland grid is is always under high high demand, as is um, most of the a lot of the, the time. I think Adrian, you know, Adrian's comments earlier about the, the grid stabilization across the nation um yeah it was a good point on that as well and, and, sorry just as a slight segue and small joke i was up uh giving a climate emergency talk to sunshine coast council who fantastically unanimously declared a climate emergency about two weeks ago so well done sunshine coast the second council in queensland to declare after noosa and nice. um, it, it, the vote Fantastic. was hilarious, actually. There was um, one person about to vote against, and he looked around, realised he was he's liberal, I think, <laughs> um, realised he's the only person. So, oh, sorry, I, I, I thought I was voting for something else. Change the vote. <laughs> <laughs> um, it worked Coward. out they were going down on the Coward. wrong side of history, So, which is great, because the more politicians who realise they don't want to be on the wrong side of history... The, you know, if that's if that's what motivates them, that's fantastic because their kids. Like, let's be blunt; their kids aren't going to forgive them for what they're doing now. So exactly. And, and the other exactly. thing, I, I assume it's completely unrelated. But don't, you don't seem to have mobile service in Southeast Queensland either. Just like it's just one huge black spot. Isn't it? That's, that was my experience up there. But some, what's wrong with Queensland? I don't know. Sorry, but we'll get back to the topic, Miles. So I'm very That's sorry about that. Blame, yeah, blame Telstra for the mobile access, yes. and uh, blame Telstra for a few things actually. Like, uh, where's my national broadband network <laughs> fiber to my home, please? Mm -hmm. Who's responsible for that magnitude of an enormous cock up? But uh, Adrian, going back to you, just put the spotlight on on the very bottom southeast corner of Australia. A few years ago, there was huge issues with power across South Australia and Victoria to do with the border. There was brownouts. People, uh, the, the conservatives were blaming renewables. The, um, the, the, the progressives were blaming the grid. What was happening with South Australia? Victoria was supplying their power. And what do you think we should be building to try and, to try and resolve this energy debate? Yeah, well, it's, I remember looking at, look, the, the, could have been keyed up for that one before this talk, but from memory, it was um, a massive wind gust took down one of the interconnectors between Victoria and South Australia, and they were blamed. They said, oh, it's all renewables, it's all the wind farms, whatever. One of the gas turbines didn't bother to turn on as well, so that sat idle. 
Um, so there's a lot of gaming in the uh, energy market where, you know, you sort of hold your asset back to wait for the price to rise and various things. So it might have been a bit of gaming. I think South Australia's changed the law around what the gas turbines have to do. And by all means, like while we're building the battery infrastructure, while building dispatchable solar concentrating thermal plants that can on demand release power back into the grid, while we're upgrading the grid, yes, we will use all the existing uh, assets that we've got and shut down in order of sort of logical process of like, okay, we can get rid of this. We've got enough generation assets now to get rid of one of the really big dirty coal power plants, or, you know, we've got enough batteries on the system or concentrating solar thermal plants, we can get rid of the gas plant. But gas plants will probably be the last you, you take off because they're gonna be, you don't have to switch them on if you don't want to, you can leave them there as an emergency. But, um, you know, we, so yeah, there's things we need to do. And, you know, we still got problems at the end of something like Queenscliff at there at the end of the power line. So they're looking at a microgrid down there for themselves. So, you know, if they get enough battery, uh, you know, decent sized battery, some local batteries, enough solar panels, you know, the grid can fail and they'll still be going. You won't even notice it. And um, so there's, there's those sort of things we're doing. Uh, just, I just want to quickly flick it back to, you know, aside from obviously let's not vote for the big parties anymore ever. And, you know, just the amount of corruption that we're seeing from both sides of mm, politics mm, mm. is just that we, we need a purge, right? But that's probably not a good word, but, you know, we need to <laughs> get rid of them. And people just need to realise we've got to change our politics and, you know, give people who aren't, you know, multi-generational political animals from family dynasties who are linked to more to their, you know, their corporate or various allies, whatever. Anyway, we've got to get rid of that. The way, you know, we Great. look at it, we've, we work with a guy called Philip Sutton. We've worked with him way back since I've worked with him since 2003. You know, basically, if we're declaring a climate emergency, you would, you would pass an act to start the process of remodeling our economy across all sectors to become carbon negative. And you've got to be really careful about these things because if we delay, one of the high risks for everyone is if we delay action and wait another 10 or 15 years to get serious about it, we might find ourselves under sort of very authoritarian governments that, uh, you know, in Victoria, there's a, you know, it's off, it's classed as right wing, but there's a lot of normal people pretty pissed off as well. But there's, a, there's an anti-protest against the ability of the Premier to declare a pandemic emergency forever. He can just keep extending it and extending it and extending it. And at the moment, he needs a Parliament's, uh, the agreement of Parliament to pass uh, an emergency act. And we have to be really careful because if we get into food shortages or other really serious problems where the grid's gone down and people are really suffering, people will go back to what they know. And in my state, it's hard lockdown. Right. It's hard lockdown and we're the most locked down city in the world. Right. So, you know, we need to get we need to make sure that the process that we're going to implement in responding to climate change is humane, democratic, engaging with the community, just. And we need to build that in right now, because if we if we wait till it, people start panicking, um, I'm not sure our current batch of politicians that are in power have. Generally, I don't think they're mentally capable of doing this in a particularly good way. You know, hopefully they could get some good consultants to do it. Maybe <laughs> let's see where they seem to go. But it's, you know, we really need to get on top of this and get a community-led, a just-led and, uh, you know, compassionate-led response to climate change that not only works for us here in Australia, but works helps our neighbours and other people around the world as well. You know, our global, be a good global citizen. Our, um, our federal I, uh, government has really shown itself to be very willing to jump into that, um, uh, you know, uh, mode of lawmaking or um, mode of decision making where it's up to uh, a minister. When it comes to national security laws, so many laws have been brought in over the past few years or, you know, 20 years uh, bipartisan, um, in a bipartisan way, where decisions can be made if the minister is satisfied. And that's not the way decisions are usually made. They should be made by parliament or they should be made by a court. And um, yeah, our federal government has shown, us, shown itself to be more than willing to uh, move toward that mode of government. And uh, 
the Pirate Party has campaigned on that for, for over 10 years, for digital democracy, for enabling greater grassroots involvement in the political process, and to campaign against the constant overreach from government spying through the Assistance and Access Bill to the, um, which we've nicknamed the Arse Access Bill, because that's literally what it does. It lets uh, the government get into the arse end of your devices and uh, conveniently hackers as well and also most recently the ensuring online safety bill will safety for who that's mm -hmm. what we're asking because it means a whole lot more spying and uh the the safety benefits are questionable roger more on that yeah really uh you you've you've summed it up it's an ass move isn't it um i mean <laughs> the the government doesn't take um the the privacy and security of its residents um and citizens citizens um seriously at all uh, there's a whole bunch of of ludicrous um you know bills that they have brought in or want to bring in um it still surprises me as someone who works in the it industry that um that any one of the developers that i'm working with could have gotten a phone call from the government saying you need to put a back door into your software and don't tell anyone or you'll go to jail um, because that's a real thing uh, and that that scares the hell out of me, right? And and this is mm. um, again to to Adrian's point. You know, the longer and bring it back to the to the climate position, this and anything else, the longer we put off uh, fixing things, the more governments will be forced into those authoritarian kind of modes. In drastic order to, emergency powers. Drastic, exactly. You know, if if this government continues to put off taking any action. Um, and and we've literally got water lapping at our front doors. I mean, don't get me wrong, I love the beach, but I live a long way away from it, so that would be a really bad thing if it's at my door. Um, you know, there is no other choice uh, than than for the, the governments of the time or the people to rise up. I mean, that's another option, I guess, right? Um, but not su not suggesting we're not advocating for violence or for revolutionary activity. No, exactly. Uh, definitely supporting the protests, but uh, to a to a certain level, right? Um, but yeah, I mean, the governments are, are already showing their disregard for the citizens' uh, privacy, um, and we need to make those those laws go away um, and bring in real protections um, in terms of people's privacy. Um, particularly in the, the growing digital space. You know, I know it's not the, the topic of this conversation, but you're starting to, to look at the metaverse and things like this being brought in by corporates. Um, well, one corporate. Um, and and that's, you know, that's something that needs to be addressed um, that I don't think the current governments have the capacity to do. Yeah, just, just even gonna... simple things like the, you know, our COVID check-in apps here in Victoria, I think it's the same in New South Wales and maybe Queensland, but, you know, mm. they are recording where I'm going on a database centrally, whereas in New Zealand that, that data is kept on your phone in theory or in the UK and Perfect. you own that data and then mm. your data references the your phone or your app or whatever references the, the uh, COVID hotspots, right, and then informed you that something's happened, right? You know, you, you've been in the proximity of X. So, and and yet why, why do we have to have it that way? Why do they, you know, if New Zealand and the UK can do it, like why does our government need to know where we're going? Our government yeah. declined that. Our government then also got in a contractor to build the COVID safe app to do just that. And when that didn't work, it had to fall back to uh, digital infrastructure that the states already had. Um, well, at least they're not sharing as far as we know that information with each other, which is where I'd like to segue back to the energy grid and the way that the uh, Queensland, New South Wales, Victorian and occasionally, most of the time now, South Australian energy grids are connected uh, in the national energy market, also with an interconnector to Tasmania. Um, but uh, the Northern Territory and the Western Australian grids are not connected. We've got two separate unconnected energy mm. grids in this country just bringing it back to um uh, transmission infrastructure um the the science party's long had a policy of uh building an in interconnector to connect these markets up um when it's uh sunny in one part of australia it's going to be uh not sunny in another and windy and and so forth um yeah but this is this is all we need we need infrastructure this the electricity grid is not new technology. It just needs 
uh, public funding to get it built. I don't think Northern Territory and Western Australia really have that much sun though, do they? <laughs> or empty space. Or do they? Oh. Mm. We can, but, have, yeah. we can pay some consultants to do a study. We'll do a study. Actually, you know what? We also um, had some uh, some great input from a, a solar company just, um, you know, just casually doing a, a little bit of, doing some sums as to what sort of energy generation could we get out of the Adani Carmichael mine site if we just left it alone, except for covering it with solar panels, which, you know, as we know, doesn't... Um, it changes the ecology of it but compared to mining and the, the rehabilitation that often doesn't happen mm -hmm. after mining um in any case cover the the mine site with solar panels um you could expect comparable energy production and more jobs and those jobs would be more ongoing than the jobs that come with digging coal out of the ground uh the cost was yeah, also pretty comparable between the mining and the, the solar panels um so yeah, again, um, the technology, the technology is here. Mm. Yeah, we used to take, think... Sorry, we, yeah. we used to take people on a, a tour when the wind turbines first started getting built in Victoria. We used to go down and visit the first uh, wind turbine down in Gippsland. Then we'd loop back around, and people would see them and go, "Oh, they're so big! Oh, look at that! You know, look at that sort of." Um, eight by eight metre footprint of the pole type thing. And then we would jump the fence and run across a paddock and go to the edge of the Hazelwood open cut mine and see a horizon wide hole in the ground. And everyone would just go, oh, okay, like that. Mm. <laughs> it was like, you know, I, I, I get the context now and uh, that Hazelwood mine. I got to see that blowing up the other day. It was it was sort of somehow satisfying. It was uh, a controlled demolition. Um, yeah, just have to put that out there. Um, nice. Yeah. One one of the things that that points to as well, um, Andrea, that you mentioned around the Adani mine, not forgetting that what they're doing there is is taking coal out of the ground so that they can ship it overseas, right? So, um, and we, I think it was mentioned earlier in tonight's chat as well that we have a tendency to use all of our amazing local resources. Um, you know whether it's whether it's coal that has helped us in the past um got to admit or other resources with um you know as we go into into the future of of more um electric vehicles we've got plenty of aluminium we've got plenty of lithium we've got plenty of copper um we do have a tendency to dig this stuff out of the ground spend um emissions and money shipping it um you know or transporting it to a port putting it on a ship, sending it overseas, having someone else convert it into a useful material and usually buying it back. Um, like that, that doesn't seem to make a whole deep, uh, a whole deal of sense to me. You're, we've got all of these uh, natural resources here. It would be a lot more economically viable um, to use those materials. If we're going to, if we've got them, use those materials here construct things here use them here you know we, we've got we've got everything we need yep. yeah it, well, yeah and, and nothing we don't do very well is actually do the full cost you know where it's all that sort of we're not putting the cost of climate change onto the coal or the gas or whatever at the moment we did a tiny bit of that the the, the, the economics would simply be no coal no gas and and i'll just sort of yeah. quickly cover the nuclear topic while we're here you know if you look at you talk to anyone who's been in the actual nuclear industry and um, there was a time when the UK looked at the the actual cost of running their power plant. So it's something like three times the normal cost of their grid or something like that. It's really high, not including the decommissioning, which is a massive expense. And the, the other thing I always like when I'm talking to sort of pure economic rationalist type people is you say, well, do you believe that a power plant should be able to get its own insurance? And they say, yeah, of course, you know, and then the moment you, if it's a nuclear power plant, the only way they ever get insurance is if the government caps the liability and takes on all the extra risk associated with a nuclear power plant failure. So they sort of effectively indemnify the power. So it, it doesn't work in a free market economy at all. And we don't need it in Australia because, you know, Beyond Zero Emissions has shown that we can do 100% renewable uh, for, you know, a, 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 with zero risk or near zero risk renewable technologies and have a 
grid that is as stable or even much more stable than our current grid currently is performing under gas and coal. So, you know, we just do not need it here in Australia. The only reason you have nu nuclear power, by the way, is if you want to build actual nuclear weapons. That's the, the, the link of why you have nuclear power. That's the long-term goal. So we've got uh, a bunch of questions in chat talking about uh, VRE and talking about transmission and talking about batteries. So does someone want to jump in here and actually uh, define for us what VRE means and what are the implications of VRE in terms of the uh, transmission grid? Yeah, well, that's the, um, the, the problem of the sun not always shining and the wind not always blowing, right? The variable, renewable, is it energy or electricity in that sense? Um, so that's... Yeah, the generation infrastructure that doesn't have what we would call firm generation that you can switch on and off at will. And that's what um, necessitates the storage infrastructure or alternatively massively overbuilding uh, for um, massively overbuilding the uh, generation infrastructure. And overbuilding is the wrong word. So what I'm talking about here is that it's difficult to have an exactly 100% renewables grid because you've got to have a lot of storage. It becomes difficult uh, somewhere between 50% and 100%. It becomes easier again at 200% renewables where you've uh, where you're generating more electricity than you need at any one time. You're storing some of that. You're using some of that for purposes that we haven't in the past, like expanding our heavy industries or our you know the industries that we've been talking about the smelting um, instead of shipping our ore overseas and buying back the products. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so uh, industries and um, uh, purpose-built infrastructure that can store that excess generation um, at the time that it's generated so then we can use it at peak times. Uh, something else that's going to help there is um, uptake of electric vehicles. So the batteries in electric vehicles um, can work themselves with you know, some um if if it's made technologically you know feasible to do so sorry it is technologically feasible um they just have to be allowed to feed their energy back into the grid when um when uh, not needed to run the car yes yeah, so someone someone said to me when we got our little electric car they've said you've bought a now in japan when you you buy a nissan leaf you can get a a charger that attaches to your house that turns your nissan leaf into a household storage device and I couldn't do that when I got my one here for some reason but you know in theory if you you know my brother in Japan his Nissan Leaf is a um, is basically he's bought a battery and had a free car thrown in right so you know he's got that ability to charge off his car for his house and the excess storage goes in um, I mean the the beyond zero emissions solve the issue of of a renewable energy grid including stability and reliability and stabilization and all of that. And the, the key element of it was the concentrating solar thermal plants with um, molten salt storage. And unlike say solar solar panels, for example, that use high grade computer grade silicon to make those solar panels, you're talking polished steel, a computer with the um, calculating ability of a Commodore 64 and, um, you, know, and poly, you know, polished steel mirrors and molten salt, right, just salt. And whammo, you've got a battery and dispatchable power when you need it. And it's all you need to do is you run your models and you work out what level of stability you need. And that works out how much of the battery systems you need. And they did that and they did it so that a chain of solar thermal plants on the inside where it's really sunny most of the time um, with a tiny proportion of biomass backup. That's all they had and a tiny proportion of bias bath. And it was like one time a year that some of the plants might have to run their biomass once a year, and that would be it. So you could do that, maybe maybe you'd have, you know, the last of the gas saved up in one big container and it would last for a while or something. But, you know, it's, um, so you, you can do that. And if you're gonna go down that, uh, as Andrew was saying, let's go down the energy exporting side of it. And we sort of overspec our grid and then you've got a lot more options because you've got all these other forms of storage coming into play and you know you might you might actually have some excess renewables going into say you know what whatever you're doing and then exporting it but yeah mm, we talk about in the science party 800 percent renewables 
partly because we have to um, get ourselves, um, well, 100% clean energy, obviously, but also we want to bring more industry on shore and we have to electrify things that we currently burn uh, gas and petrol to power directly. So uh, when we say 800% renewables, people say, how can you have more than 100%? 100% is the maximum. But currently, we dig up about eight times more coal than we use and ship it overseas. So we have 800% coal. How good would it be to replace that with clean energy? We have an undersea cable for uh, the series of tubes that the internet flows through. So why don't we build an undersea cable for the uh, series of solar energy we, we send overseas instead of all this coal? Then, you know, magnates, like mine, miners like uh, Twiggy Forrester and good old Gina Reinhardt can still be filthy rich with their billions of dollars, but at least they can do it without trashing the planet. How's that for an idea? That's a wonderful one. And, and we and let's not forget, you know, we, we kept talking about electric cars, but there's also the reality of let's let's get some more electric rail and decent public, you know, uh, walking infrastructure, mm. cycling infrastructure, all the basics down pat. And another one of the really good Beyond Zero Emission report is just looking at the uh, an East Coast high super high speed rail type thing, you know, mm. aka where they've got those sort of trains everywhere else in the world in sort of you know the OECD type countries. And, you know, one of the, I think it's the third biggest, but you know, pre-COVID, the third biggest air, you know, city to city air hop in the world was Melbourne to Sydney. Mm -hmm. So you put a high speed rail between those two cities and you, you know, lo and behold, you don't need that second second airport in, in Sydney and an extra runway here and there. And you just mm -hmm. cut out all those plane emissions as well and have it running on renewables. Sydney and to right Brisbane's now, not far behind. Yeah, and if, if you've ever done the train ride between Melbourne and Sydney, it's sort of hilarious. Like the trains are really old. It's like going back to the 1970s or 80s or something. There's no decent computing things to plug into without electrocuting your computer. And it goes through a section which is so slow, it's steam. It's literal steam train alignment. So it chugs down to about 60 kilometres an hour and just goes chug, 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 chug around these hills like this, nice and gently. And you're going, really, do we care that little about our core infrastructure that we're, we have for the It's Australia, really, it's just Australia. And you know, probably the people not listening to the show, you know, you're not the problem, it's your relatives and your friends. And, you know, <laughs> I've yeah. talked a lot about uh, electric vehicles. Uh, tonight, but uh, really we need fewer cars per person in Australia. Uh, and we can do that by making uh, you know better public transport and more walkable, more bikeable cities um, to save the uh, the space on the road and the the rubber that uh, is also a pollutant for for the people who really need the cars. Um, and I, that comes back to the point that uh, we made before that I didn't jump in on about uh, densifying our cities. If you live in a city, presumably you want to live mm. close to where you study or work. Um, and yeah, we do have this um, this Australian dream of the, the quarter acre, um, but we're uh, clearing land for, for these sprawling suburbs now when you know, not everyone, I'm not going to tell people the sort of house they can live in, but I want to live in a nice house that happens to be stacked 10 houses high and I share my backyard with my 10 neighbours. That would be awesome. But the quality of apartments that um, you tend to get in Australia really put people off. We've got 10 year old apartment towers in Sydney that are cracking and people having to evacuate and losing their home. Um, so of course, um, apartment buildings get a, a you know, very bad reputation in Australia, mm. but it's a it's an efficient way to live for the people who want to live in a city close to where they work and study. And you can Andrew, link those together, right? Um, sorry, sorry, go on. Oh, I was just going to say you link you link those two things together. You link decent public transport um, with that uh, decision for people to either live close to the city. Um, in a in a stacked stacked area where they're willing to do that, and you get the efficiencies of being close to the city, or you take yourself far away from the city and you transport yourself in 
um, using decent public transport. Um, you know, I, I live about a, almost an hour's train ride out of the CBD here in Brisbane, and I would love to work on the way to and from. Um, but as I think, was it Adrian, you mentioned our, our, our cell reception is not so great in uh in southeast queensland so i mean there's a there's a couple of really simple things that can be done um along the way as well you know we've, we've talked about some really big changes um and there are some really small simple things that can be done as well andrew we talk about uh we talk about trains and i i like trains i want to talk some more about trains i just i don't just want to talk about trains though i also want to talk about uh uh, our vision for the future that we're we're trying to build. I want to talk about uh, transport. I want to talk about universities and education, and I want to talk about a certain charter city, which which you're proposing to build. What's happening there? Yeah. Um, well, yeah, we do um, support building not just a city but cities um, to uh, to be hubs of study and industry and. Uh, starting out in the most feasible places, uh, which would be along a, a high-speed rail line, we suppose, um, not too far from Sydney. Um, yeah, um, built, you know, according to... Um, uh, with with high density for the people that want to, as I say, work and study in a place like that. And people say, you can't just build a city. Of course you can. Every city never used to be a city until it was built. You you just decide that you want to build a city somewhere, get by, and of course it's difficult, it's complex. Um, but uh, there's no reason that uh, it can't be done if there is if there is the will to do it. And we have, um, as, as we've talked about, sprawling cities. Like I, I would love so much if uh, Sydney as a city of 5 million people was five small cities that you could commute between through bushland from one to the other. Mm -hmm. And that's the sort of urban planning that I want to see, small, dense cities that are, are walkable and have uh, public transport links. You can, I, I lived in Canberra for and worked in Canberra for a couple of years, and Canberra is obviously a, a design-built city, and uh, it was really cool. And while I was there, I was tasked with campaigning to uh, put the tram system in that they forgot to build, which was actually designed into the city. Like all those really wide streets when you come down Northbourne Avenue and all that sort of stuff, that that, that day one, there were meant to be trams going up and down them. So, and now they're doing it like, you know, 15 years later, so it's finally getting done. So you can design some, and Canberra's a, quite a nice place to live. It doesn't have that density thing too much. That's a, a bit spread out, but does have those lovely connections with nature that are a walking distance for everyone it makes it such a nice difference compared to you know living in just dense urban suburban school missing those sort of natural zones where kangaroos bouncing down the street and things like that so this is a vision for what we want to build and this is a proposal for what we want to build and we can see what we need to do. We know what we need to do. We have the technology and we have the know-how. And what we need now is just the support and the buy-in. We have the volunteers and we have the candidates running out there. And if we come together and if we bring our people together in our parties, then we have a chance that we just might be able to build that charter city on that high-speed rail. We might be able to build that 800% renewables. We might be able to build that next generation energy mix to save our old growth rainforests, to recapture soil carbon. The Liberals emission reductions plan doesn't have that proposal, but tonight we've laid it out for you and you can find it on our website, on the Vote Plant website, on the Science Party website, on the Pirate Party websites. You can find what we're going to do. And what we're asking now is moving into a 2022 election soon. These three individuals you can see on the screen with me, Andrew Leong, Science Party, Roger Watling, Pirate Party, Adrian Whitehead, Vote Planet, they're going to be on ballots, on ballot papers in a polling booth near you. And we're going to be asking you to choose the future that you want to see. We're going to be asking you to choose and vote for the future that you want to see. Because too long have Australians voted for empty policies and empty sound bites for politicians who react to focus groups rather than reacting to new developments in science and technology, for politicians who are endlessly chasing fear and panic and division rather than a hopeful, positive and optimistic future, which we have laid out for you. 
And so these candidates are going to be on that paper and they're going to be asking you, asking you what? Andrea? Well, yeah, we've all said it a lot tonight that uh, we have the technology. So uh, just um, vote for us, vote for candidates like us who will make the decisions to do what needs to be done for a safe future. Roger? Yeah, absolutely. If, you, um, if you've always been supporting the cause, you're donating to those causes, uh, the only thing that really fixes this long term is uh, a change in the government. And that's why I'm here representing an alternative to the major parties and I think the others on, the, uh, on this panel as well. And Adrian? Yeah, I, I just really want people not to forget the, that we have a preferential system in Australia and you can vote for any of the minor parties. You can vote for three or four of us in a row. It doesn't matter. So long as you put the, the worst people at the bottom and pick which of the two major parties you want above the other, right? That's what matters. And you can have them right down at the bottom. You can have Labor above Liberal, Liberal above Labor, puff underneath them, of course. But you, you, you don't forget that. And so many people just think that they're wasting their votes when they're voting for the minor parties, but it's a double vote. It's a triple vote. It's a quadruple vote. And your vote will go to, if we don't win, if we don't win and we want to win, if, we, if your vote will go to the major party of your choice and you're not wasting it at all. So just, just remember that. And also you get to take $2 off a major party. That's important. <laughs> Thank you so much, everyone, for tuning in tonight. This has been the Science Party, Pirate Party, and Vote Planet Party. We are going to bring the screen down shortly, but uh, for those of you who want to keep the discussion going, and those of you who've got a few drinks on the standby, ready to go live, we're going to be having a social night immediately following this event. Join us on Discord. The invite link is in chat. Just click on discord.gg slash dd2s5rg. Join us for social Friday night and uh, we hope to see you all there thank you so much for tuning in and enjoy your weekend thanks for hosting it's been wonderful yeah thanks miles yeah thanks miles thanks everyone <laughs>